opportunity. Thank you, folks, for being here tonight, braving the snow. Uh, I mean, hey, listen, we're New Yorkers. This is just what we do. If you will, open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 12. Um, it's, it's good to be out in church on a night when we don't have to be out on chur at church. It's good to be uh, where we can hear the preaching of the gospel. And, uh, and, and quite frankly, I'd sooner be here just listening to, listen to everybody else preach. But uh, uh, the, I, I'm always thankful for the opportunity. Always thankful for the opportunity to help my fellow Christians. And uh, by preaching, when, when I'm coming in to preach, I'm not looking to skin you. I'm not looking to walk all over you. I'm hoping that when, when I get done, the Holy Spirit is giving you something from either this message or something you've seen close by. Uh, sometimes you, you look at one side of the page. I've got you looking at one side of the page, and you look at the other side of the page, and, and a verse stands out, and God reaches up and says, that's what you need, dummy. And uh, that's, you know, I hope that happens. But uh, I hope the, hope the messages are a blessing to you, and uh, it's Brother Keck, right? I'm going to work on that. I've got to work on that. Luke chapter 12, verse uh, 42, we'll read uh, the opening passage. Uh, for, verse 42 says, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to dr eat and drink, and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. And here's, here's, here's if you will, the money quote, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and money, your, your, your love and your blessings to us. We thank you for the, the, the many blessings that we have. And we pray, Father, that you'll uh, help us to uh, go through your word tonight. Uh, help me to speak the words I should speak and not say the words I shouldn't say. And uh, help me to dwell where I need to dwell and move on where I need to move on. And Father, I pray that you bless uh, not only this message, but Brother Keck as he preaches next. Uh, Father, give him your anointing and uh, uh, help him to speak to us words that we need so that we might grow in your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you will, turn back to the book of Exodus chapter 5, um, or Exodus chapter 4 actually. Uh, read that while you're doing that. I'm just going to look at this once more. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall mu be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. And listen, folks, uh, we're going to talk about a great steward that God put in charge of a, a good many people. We're going to talk about the man Moses. And we're going to talk about that in relation to uh, the pastor of the church. But I'm also going to talk to you at the end. I'm going to put in your hands and, and hopefully it will impart to you the understanding that you are stewards as well. Each of us is a steward. And uh, it, while well, we're going to talk about Moses and we're going to talk specifically about pastors and, and taking care of our pastors, but I'm going to speak also concerning the responsibility you and I have for one another. In, Mos or in, yeah, in Moses, it's, I'm a music guy. Music guys don't know anything about the Bible. Moses chapter 2. Moses, Exodus chapter 4. We'll get it together here. Exodus chapter 4 and verse, verses 1 through 9. We see that uh, uh, the Lord has appeared to Moses. And as you read through these verses, in verse 1 it says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. They will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Moses did not want the job. Moses, the Lord had come to Moses and said, I want you to go down to Egypt. I want you to tell Pharaoh to, tell, to let my people go. And we know the story and you've heard it all many times before. And we're going to look at some of the things that are imparted in this story. And uh, what happens is the, he says the people will never believe him. And the Lord gives him three signs to give to the people. And then he says in verse 10, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. 
And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? By the way, this is a, this is, this is a life verse for you. This is a verse that you can take, t- take with you and carry with you. If God asks you to do something, it's because you can do it. He's not going to ask you to fly. He's, now, I'm all good with airplanes and stuff. Uh, he's, he's not going to ask you to run down the road to 60 miles an hour, and I'm all good with cars too. Uh, I don't have a problem with either of those things, but physically you are not capable. There isn't anybody here capable of moving that fast, is there? I didn't think so. And nobody here capable of flying without, without getting in an airplane, right? Okay. That's good. I'm glad for that. But he says here to Moses, he says, No, therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, verse 12, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, Oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. So Moses planted his feet, and he made excuse to God, and finally God says, okay, he says, I'm going, to give, I'm going to saddle you with Aaron. You know, sometimes the things we ask for are really not the things we want. By the way, you'll find out later on that, that Moses doesn't wait a whole lot for, for Aaron to talk as, as they get later in their ministry. But early on in the ministry, Aaron does the speaking. And we also find out that Aaron makes some mistakes, but we'll go on, we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, we see that he still tried to get out of, the, out of doing the job. He did not want the job. He liked tending sheep. Sheep didn't talk back. Sometimes they weren't obedient, but they didn't talk back. And it was an easy job. He knew what he had to do. And for 40 years, he'd gotten good at it. But he, rel- he, he, he relinquishes and goes. He relents and goes. And he goes to the people, and they're all excited, and they get all excited, and he, he says, all right, now I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh. He goes and talks to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, you know, who is the Lord? And that's in chapter 5. Verse 4 says, And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works, get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Now, behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. Pharaoh didn't want anything to do with God, and he didn't want anything to do with letting the people go. And he said, you're not going to change anything. And what happens next is tough. The people are sold. The, the Pharaoh tells his, his taskmasters, he says, don't give them any more straw, but I want the same amount of brick. The taskmasters go to the leaders of the people. The leaders of the people go to the, to, the, to the Israelites and say, we don't have straw anymore, we've got to go gather stubble. And they go and do that, and they can't get the number of bricks out that they need to get out. And what happens that next is the officers are beaten. Verse 15, Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants. And they say unto us, Make brick, and behold, thy servants are beaten, but thy, the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall ye deliver the tale of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case, and, and after it was said, ye shall not minish aught from the bricks of your daily task. And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh, and they said unto them, The Lord look upon you, and judge, because ye have made our Savior to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. <coughs> the leaders were bl- beaten, And they didn't understand. They thought they were going to be free. They said, this isn't working out the way we expected. When God starts moving in your life, it won't work out the way you expect it. And sometimes there'll be a little bit of hardship. But it didn't last long. But we see that Pharaoh, or not Pharaoh, we see that Moses steps up and does something from the, that he will do from this point on in his 40-year ministry with the Israelites. Verse 22, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, Wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? You see, Moses was called and he, he didn't have the whole picture either. You know what? Pastor doesn't always have the whole picture. Not right away. 
In fact, my dad has said many times, if he had the whole picture, he says he wouldn't have gone. And then he finishes the prayer, For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. And it carries right, the conversation carries right on into verse, uh, verse 1 of the next chapter. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And what Moses does here is he prays. And because he prays, he gets, he gets word from God, he gets comfort from God that everything is going to be okay. I keep thinking I got my cell phone on and I'm thinking I need the baptistry to put it in. That's not the cell phone though, so I won't baptize it. I'm going to move it though because it's going to distract me. We see that Moses begins his ministry with the Israelites. If you go over to Exodus chapter 32, while you're turning there, there's been a few things that have happened. Moses and the Israelites watch the land of Egypt get plagued with ten different plagues, including the death of the firstborn. Pharaoh says, get out of here before we all die. The people of, of Egypt give everything they can to the Israelites and say, here, take it, get out of here before we all die. And the Israelites go. But God, instead of taking them up to the promised land, He takes them across and down to the Red Sea. He takes them in between some mountains on the north and some mountains on the south through a little trail and takes them out onto a sandbar on the Red Sea. And about that time, Pharaoh shows up. God was not surprised when Pharaoh showed up. The Israelites had no choice but turn to God. And when they did, Moses went to God and said, what should we do? And God says, raise your hand. Raise your rod. And the Red Sea parted. The land dried. They went through on dry ground. They get on the other side. Now you'd think at this point in time, in fact, actually uh, one of the things they said was, did, did God bring us out here to die because there weren't any graves in Egypt? Did God bring us out here to die? By the way, God will not bring you to a rock and a hard place to bring you there to die. If He's bringing you to a place that you can't fix, it's because He wants to fix it for you. Sometimes God wants to show you what God can do. They go on, they get on the other side, and then they come to some water. It's bitter. They can't drink it. But God shows them away. But every time they start murmuring, they start murmuring and they complain. But Moses gets alone with God and says, what should I do? God says, throw this tree in. Now that doesn't sound to me like a water purification device, but it worked because they did what God said. They go on a little further, and I might have these two things backwards in my mind at the moment. They go on a little further. They need water again. What do they do? They murmur and complain. Did God bring us out here to die? Uh, we've already had this lesson. You shouldn't need it again. Uh, uh, listen, Christians, how many times have we needed that lesson over and over again? God didn't bring us here to die, right? I see some smiles and hear some amens. That's because you guys have been there more than once. And what happens is uh, Moses smites a rock, and the water comes forth. We get all the way down to the point where they get to the Mount of God and God gives them the Ten Commandments and tells them, you're not to make any graven image, but while Moses is up on the mount, the Israelites make a golden calf. This is where Aaron, by the way, was the biggest pain in the neck for Moses. Moses comes down and said, what did this people unto thee? He says, I threw in their gold. He says, and out came this calf. But in verse 7, verse 6 of chapter 32, we see this. It says, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. By the way, here's something, here's something to point out. Uh, God and Moses were like a husband and wife. 
Husbands and wives, how many times have you said, your kid? You know? Mary look at me and say, do you know what your son did? I go, oh no. Or I'll say, do you know what your son did? It's the same son. It's the same kid. It's like I'm blaming her. But look what Mo God says, thy people that you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a golden calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And listen, folks, this was a valid offer. If God made it to Moses, it was a valid offer. And if Moses had chosen the other route, we would be talking about the people of Moses today, not the people of Israel. But Moses, in spite of the fact, uh, in spite of the possible temptation that it was, he besought the Lord his God, verse 11, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent this evil against thy people. Listen, this was a valid offer. Moses may, may not have been so much concerned about the people of Israel as he was about God's name being blasphemed among the heathen. He says, you don't want your name on this. You don't want your name on the destruction of these people. And Moses prays for these people. In verse 14 it says, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. This is a recurring theme. Look at chapter 11, if you will, of Numbers. We'll zip over to the, the book of Numbers. We'll spend most of our time here now. <coughs> now remember, we're talking about Moses being a steward. God gave him a great responsibility, but God also gave him a way out. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. There is not a, from what I know uh, of my own dad and preachers that I've talked to about such subjects, there is not a time, there's not a preacher that has not had a time in his life where he thought, you know, I could go somewhere else. I've been pastoring for X number of years and, and, and I could probably get a better work elsewhere. Now, that's the thinking, but I'm going to tell you right now. He'll deal with sinners no matter where he goes. So when he gets his head right, when he gets his heart right with God, he'll realize that nine, I, I don't know, 90, 95% of the time, I believe God puts a man right where he's supposed to be all his life. I think some preachers are, uh, God puts him for a short period of time or for maybe a, maybe a, a slightly longer period of time. And he, he gives them the responsibility of oversight for the flock for short periods of time in different places. But for the most part, I believe most men are called and they'll spend most of their life in one place, serving the Lord as pastor. And it has to be, it really has, if a man's right, it's going to have to be really clear and God's going to have to lead him out or almost drag him out when he goes. If... God changes his mind, changes where he wants him to be. But in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1, we see when the people complained to displease the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger kindled, anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp, parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Moses gets alone with God, and the fire is quenched. Verse 4 says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Folks, they were complaining about how God provided for them. But listen, I'm going to tell you something. It's interesting, if you do a little study... Uh, over in the book of Joshua, you find out that they crossed the, river, the Jordan River in Joshua chapter 3. And in Joshua chapter 5, they ate of the corn of the old land and the manna went away. These people at this point in time were le had left the mount. They were on their way to the promised land. Maybe, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months before they would cross over into the promised land. But they were on their way to go get the promised land. 
So this was only going to be temporary. But they're complaining about it. Your situation here in life, listen, if you, if you have a bad life, if you have a whole life of misery and everything else, listen, it, even though you have a whole life of misery here, compared to heaven and all of eternity, it's going to be nothing. Now, listen, I'm all for not being miserable. I don't like being miserable. My wife doesn't like it when I'm miserable. I don't like it when she's miserable. We don't like to be miserable. We're just not miserable type of people. Some, of, some people like to be miserable. But listen, folks, if your whole life is terrible, it's but a short time. Don't, don't get complaining. But you notice another thing here. When they were complaining, they were complaining openly. They were complaining to one another. You know, do you, you know, walking around, do you know how bad the Lord's treating me? And, you, and they, the other one come back and say, yeah, well, the Lord's treating me this bad too. And they're murmuring amongst each other. Instead of getting along with God and saying, Lord, I don't think this is the way you should be treating me. By the way, Psalm 73, I call it the prayer of, of the wayward Christian. I may have preached it here at one of the fellowship meetings. Listen, there is a time to get alone with God and tell Him what's truly on your heart. And if you read Psalm 73, you'll find out that in the first 16 verses of that psalm, that guy was totally out of God's will. And then he says in verse 17, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, or sanctuary of the Lord. And everything changed. The whole psalm changes. The second half of the psalm changes. But here, Moses would get along with God and he would pray and he would intercede and that was his job. He became the intercessor. Now, God didn't tell him. God didn't sit down and say, now listen, you are going to have to pray for these people all the time. You are going to have to intercede for these people because they do stupid on steroids. They do, they're they're going to be the most stiff-necked, hard nosed people. They're going to be the worst people in the world to lead. You're going to hate this job and you are going to have to spend a lot of time in prayer. But this man figures it out early. He's got to pray. To the preachers in this room, we need to be a praying people. We need to be praying men. We need to be praying for our people. In fact, Moses even gets alone with the Lord later on in this chapter. In verse 10, the people are weeping. It says, the, Lord, the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And then, here's, here's that back and forth that Moses and God had. Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people on me? And listen, this is a point that we as Christians need to realize is our pastor has the burden of every one of us on his heart. At least he should. And we can expect that, that the pastor that's doing right is going to do that. If you look at chapter 12, we won't stop there, but Moses prays for Miriam. In chapter 13, we find that the Israelites decide that they're going to reject God's plan. The very thing for which he had, had designed for them to do was to go into the land of Canaan and take the land, and they said, we can't do it. And then they planted their feet and said, we won't do it. And God said, fine, you won't go. Look at verse 11 of chapter 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and, and how long will it be ere they receive me, believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence, and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation, and mightier than they. I'll give you a better deal. I'll give you a better deal. Maybe God was just plain tired of them too. Verse 13. Moses is worried about God and God's name. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them. Therefore 
He hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is longsuffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even till now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy mercy word. Preachers, we need to be intercessors. We need to be interceding for our people. And the people in this church, you should expect that your pastor does that. The people that are visiting from other churches, you should expect that your pastor is doing just that. In chapter 16 of Numbers, Dathan, Abiram, and Korah rise up against God. And God proposes once again, He proposes judgment. In verse 11, We read this. I'm sorry, verse 20. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? By the way, here's another thing to encourage you. And not just, not just for the pastors, but you and I as, as, as fellow Christians, as members of our church, Aaron was not too swift to start with. But we see here that Aaron and Moses, Moses and Aaron get down and they pray the same thing. Why? And Moses, Aaron finally got the picture of what was supposed to happen. That's a side message. That's free. We need to bring others along in our Christian walk. We need to help others to learn how to love the Lord and how to pray to God. And the two of them pray as one man, really. They say, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with the congregation? And then he gives them a determination, says, Go tell the congregation to get away from Dathan and Byram and, uh, and, and Korah. And the congregation gets away from them. And God takes them. But then these dummies, and I told you, I told you, these people sometimes they get a little on the dumb side. Look at verse 41. And it came, now this is the same chapter. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses. And, I'm sorry, but on the morrow, this is verse 41 I'm supposed to be reading. But on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Now did they not see what happened the day before? Now Moses, Moses wasn't one to go around saying, You know what, I think I don't like Malcolm. I'm going to ask the ground to open up underneath him. Or I, I don't like this guy or that guy. I'm going to ask God. Moses didn't do things like that. He pronounced what God said. And God did what God said he would do. And these people are dumb enough to accuse Moses. But you know what? He goes to prayer again. And he sends Aaron in with incense. And the people are saved. Let's continue on. Numbers chapter 21. We're getting close to the end. Remember, this man was a praying man, and our preachers ought to be praying people. We should expect that our pastors and that our preachers pray for us. Look at verse 4 of chapter 21. And, their journey, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. It's sometimes life's tough and people get discouraged. But this is where they went wrong. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Do you know God never takes it as an affront if you confront Him where you think He's wrong? By the way, Brother Legault has a great... You all know Brother Bryant Legault. He has a great saying and I, I use it all the time. God is always good. God is never wrong. God is always good, and God is never wrong. So sometimes we get to thinking God's allowed something in our lives, and we think that He's out of uh, that he's, he's out of God's will. We think that He's wrong for it. Not out of God's will, but you get where I'm coming from. Sometimes we just think He's wrong. If you get along with God and tell Him what's on your heart, as you get along with God, He starts to straighten out your thinking. But these people... Spake against God and against Moses. Why? Because they weren't talking to God. They were talking to one another. That's the difference. 
That's the difference. They were talking to one another instead of talking to God. And then they gripe about what they're eating again. And the Lord sent fiery serpents, and this time God didn't make it easy. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses. What they always did, they, 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 they got right with God and went back to the preacher. They came to Moses and said, We have sinned. You think? For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, but God didn't fix it right away. He says, make a fiery serpent. Now, I don't know if you're aware of it, but to, to make a fiery serpent out of brass, you have to heat the brass and you have to form it. It takes hours, if not days, to create something like this. So all the time he's working on this, I mean, we see it happen in, in just a second. It, the, he tells him in verse 8 to make it. In verse 9, he makes the serpent, but it might have taken a day or so to get this thing done. He put it on a pole and then they could be healed. But Moses prayed for the people. Back to chapter 20. One thing the Israelites were good at doing is complaining. Fellow Christian, sound familiar? Things aren't going our way. We start complaining. Chapter 20, they complain. Verse 2. And there was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? Really? And therefore, and wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. And they go and they pray. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces. They're praying again. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto them and God tells them what to do. So they go to do it, but somewhere in there, I think that Moses and Aaron talked about this, and they said, you know what, we're getting sick of, the, sick of the attitude of these people. And they did something that was a little brash. And by the way, Moses and Aaron both were condemned for this, but Moses was, was the one who raised, his, raised the rod. He was, he was only supposed to speak to the, to the rock, and water was to come forth. But he took the rod, and he smote the rock, not once but twice, Verse 11, And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, Judgment falls immediately, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Forty years. Forty years. And he does one thing in that 40 years that could be considered even remotely bad. And I realize he broke with the type and all that stuff, but, you know, it's a type of, the rock is a type of Christ. Once it's smitten, you know, it's always got, the water is always available. You just have to ask. Moses loses his cool and he is immediately judged. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48, we said, To whom much is given, much is required. Folks, you and I have much given to us too. If you have a pastor who loves you, you've been given much. In these passages, and I've read through these chapters, I've read through the, the four books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which all involve Moses, and I have never read once, and I challenge anyone to find out and show me, where anyone, where any one of the children of Israel is documented to have prayed for Moses. You may have what you think is the greatest pastor in the world. You may look up to him and you may think he's almost infallible, but he's not. You and I need to pray for our pastor. In fact, I believe this so much 
that in my travels I've met pastors and, and as I meet pastors, they go on my prayer list. Turn back, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6. I, I put pastors on my prayer list. I put their churches on my prayer list. I put their wives and their children on my prayer list. Why do I do that? I'll tell you why I do it. It's because I feel that I'm responsible for them. They're now part of my ministry. And in your church, you ought to be praying for your pastor, and you ought to be praying for his wife, and you ought to be praying for their children. And, you, and listen, I'm going to tell you right now, in your church, you ought to get the church list and pray for everybody on the church list. You ought to pray for your acquaintances that aren't saved because you may have opportunity and you need, to have, you need to have a consciousness of their lost soul and you need to have a consciousness of when the opportunity is to speak to them. You also need to have a heart that loves them. And you only get that love. Listen, when you get out there among the ungodly, and if you're working a regular job, you're out amongst the ungodly, the only way you're ever going to learn to love those people is to invest in them. And prayer is where you do it. Look at Ex or Exodus. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication. By the way, that's our communication with God. He just got done giving them the, all the tools of the Spirit. And then he says you got to pray. Why? So you can be in contact with God. But then he goes on and says, And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You say, what do you mean all saints? All the saints you know. All the saints you know. You need to pray for them. And then he says this. And this is the Apostle Paul, the man who they called Mercurius because he was a chief speaker. The man who could speak at the drop of a hat, who could go up on, the, on, the, on Mars Hill and talk to the heathen who had known nothing of God and he could go and preach Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. He could preach that on Mars Hill. He says, and for me. He's talking about praying. Pray for me. That utterance may be given unto me. Really? That I may open my mouth boldly. Paul didn't feel he was bold enough to make known the mystery of the gospel. Listen, the greatest preacher, arguably one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. I don't know if you could call him the greatest, but one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. Wrote half a year New Testament. And folks, he said to the people, he says, pray for me. I need your prayers. So I close out with this question. Will you pray for your Moses? Will you pray for your Moses? He needs your prayers. As strong as he may be, as strong as you might think he is, he needs your prayers. One misstep, and Moses missed out. But what would have happened if the whole congregation got alone with God and said, God, Moses has been our man, and he's interceded for us so many times. Can you please let him come in? Maybe, we, maybe this thing would have read a little different. Maybe this book would have read a little different if somebody had prayed for Moses. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and mercy. Lord, we thank you for the, the, your word and the many examples you've given, into us, given to us to, for, uh, of how we should live our lives. Father, help us to live our lives as you would have us to live them. Father, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to pray for those other Christians that we know. Our fellow servants in our own churches and our fellow servants that we know from other churches. Our pastors, preachers that we know, and the unsaved as well. Help us to be that testimony. Help us to invest with prayer in Jesus' name.